Kid, seriously. Welcome to a tanned and well-rested return of the Star Wars in Review podcast. The only podcast to take the S out of safe and the F out of way. Over there, it's Luke Neitzel, who is a lover of animals. And over here, Maya Madrid, who prefers giraffes to elephants. Every so often, we get together to discuss the news in the realm of Star Wars, answer some of your questions that kids seriously got, and review an episode from the Clone Wars series. Luke Neitzel, it's been a while. It's been two weeks since a week off. Tell us, how are you? I'm good. We made exciting new intro music, which is completely different than, than what we were doing before, so it's like a whole new show. It is. It's, yeah. it's completely new. We should just rebrand and everything. Mm-hmm. It's amazing. So you've been watching a lot of the World Cup. Yeah. I take it. Mm-hmm. Um, Got my Croatia shirt on because they, they I, did I pretty like well that, today. That that red checkerboard. Any day that Leo Messi cries is a good day for me. It's not the same without the United States. I'm feeling, I don't know how you feel about it. Like, I'm not as jazzed. But there have been some fun games. I watched Mexico and Germany with my dad on uh, Father's Day, and France is doing well, so that makes me happy. What's been your experience with it so far? Obviously, I'd rather the U.S. was there, and you don't get that big excitement you get on the game day of a team you really, really care about. But of how many games a World Cup has, the U.S. generally plays four or less of those games. So I don't think it's cutting down my overall experience. And I will say I had a moment watching the Panamanian players hear their national anthem and seeing some of the Panamanian announcers and stuff like that, where I, you know, seeing them cry and how emotional they were and how they've never gotten to see their team in a World Cup before. I kind of went, yeah, I'd still rather be there, but this is kind of an okay trade-off um, to see these people go through that emotional high and to see what we take for granted, that we should just be there automatically to see them really, really appreciate being there. You see Americans there. can somewhat be entitled sometimes? Shocking, yeah. I know. So those parts of it, are, I, I think, are cool. Um, I don't have a team I'm super all about i am in my croatia shirt and i do hope they do well but that's mainly based on the fact that they always have the coolest uniforms uh, i cheer for for germany which feels kind of cheap but one of my best friends is german actual german citizen german so it's nice to see him do well uh i picked france to win it all and i said that going into it that i was cheering for germany and, and colombia was kind of my team that could win it that i was hoping would win it type thing and germany and colombia haven't done so well so <laughs> and france is into the next round but they aren't blowing me away with their performances i thought but... they played well today i thought and i feel very strongly that peru was getting a away with a lot of calls that was a very physical game the matuidi yellow card that happened early i thought was was unfair i was actually talking with jed about it on online on twitter a little bit um i think france played better than they're getting credit for but they didn't play like someone you look at as go oh yeah they're 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 the most talented team at the world cup and they're a, a favorite to win i, I think going you through part... a grinder is kind of i mean it kind of colors that maybe but I, you know, you don't think that France should have to park the bus for most of the game against Peru. True. And Peru, they did. Peru played hard. I mean... I, I think Peru has been super entertaining. That's another team where their national anthem got to me to see how excited they were in that first game. And they played such an exciting style. It was really fun to watch that I was sad for them when it didn't work out. That right back that they have that super fast guy is super fun to watch. I wish I could remember his name right now. It's like as in or something along those lines. But is that the worst penalty kick you've ever seen this side of Roberto Baggio? <laughs> I don't know. I've seen some bad ones. I've that, seen who was it, Kay Kamara, that we always Kai Kamara. Kai Kamara. One other thing, as long as we're on the international route, that I want to talk to you about is the Canadian Football League. ESPN Plus is something we talked about on the show that we both got for MLS. But one of the other added um, added benefits is that you get every single Canadian Football League game. Um, I've been watching a lot of it because it's just fun and I love football and there's so many different rules. You get three, three downs instead of four, different size field, 12 players. The wide receivers can like run at the line of scrimmage in motion and they all can go in motion. And so I was wondering if you've ever watched Canadian football and what your opinions on, on that great, great league are. I love it. So that's why I wanted to talk about it. I honestly have none. I, I watch the Vikings. I don't watch nfl games that aren't the vikings i don't well i watch the badgers because my wife is a, a very big badger fan but i don't particularly care about college football it's not a sport i watch i watched my one team that i like so sorry to dead end this really quick no, I've, I've never seen a canadian football league game i'm 
I'm sure they're exciting if you like f- football in that sense, but unfortunately that's not me. Early on we had some Canadian people who were tuning into the show and tuning into the website, or I guess logging into the website. So if there's anybody out there who can decide what team I should cheer for, right now I'm on the fence between the Argos and the Alouettes, but I'm kind of open. I so do like, like the fact that they, at one time, I don't know if they still do, they had like two or three teams that were named Tiger Cats. <laughs> they just so, had Hamilton. I didn't, so they have there was the a Hamilton. couple There was a couple of them that had the same name. Very cool that part was about, about Hamilton Tiger Cats, their coach is June Jones, who's an old run and shoot guy, which is a really fun offense. The bad part about the Hamilton Tiger Cats is they have Johnny Manziel and he beat the crap out of his girlfriend. Well, so do we think, think he's going to be there that long anyway? I don't know. Is he playing well? I have no idea. Well, he's a backup right now, so who knows? That's enough CFL talk. Let's get to the news. (laughs) Our new CFL segment. (laughs) Originally reported by Collider's Frosty Weintraub and followed up by... That can't be a real name. It's Steve Weintraub. His (laughs) name is Frosty. (laughs) It all sounds made up from start to finish. Frosty wine drop something. It's like the head of Collider. <laughs> I don't. I don't care. No, your industry, dude. It sounds made up. <laughs> well, anyways, Steve Weintraub, who goes by Frosty because that's his nickname, and followed up by everyone else on the planet, Lucasfilm has decided to pull back on the saga spinoff of Star Wars story films for the time being. Announced films like Boba, F- the Boba Fett movie directed by James Mangold, as well as an unannounced but in develop, dil- excuse me, in developed. Obi Wan movie. I in development. Obi-Wan that's what movie. I meant to say. I have it written here. You can look at it. I just no, can't I believe say you. it properly. I apparently can't read my own writing. Uh, the Obi Wan movie are now placed firmly on the back burner, at least as of this morning, um, after Star Wars failure at the Solo Cave. The article goes on to discuss the focus being put on the next set of films. We have Ryan Johnson's next trilogy, which we're told is going to end Ray's story. And then there are a second set of films discussed as a series that are written. Ryan Johnson's play. trilogy isn't ending Ray's story. Ryan... That's what that was. What the no, no, it's, it says the they're going to focus on episode nine, which is going to end Ray's story, and then Ryan Johnson's trilogy. I don't think that's what the article. Said, I read it today. I, like, I also read it today. Okay, should we pull it up? Yeah, go ahead. All right, let's pull it up. All right, so after further review, I was wrong. Luke was right. I apologize to him, to his family, to all of our listeners, all of our viewers on YouTube, my family, George Lucas, and anybody else who has been offended or hasn't been offended by my earlier comments. It was a rough 45 seconds. It was. I'm ready to move past it. Good. So we got Ryan Johnson's next trilogy. Then we got the second set of films discussed as a series that are written by Benioff and Weiss of Game of Thrones. Uh, these rumors don't really discuss the Favreau Star Wars series set, but the assumption is that's going to keep going so long as Disney gets the rights to Fox, which is also up in the air. I assume they're still going to have that subscription service, whether or not they get the Fox films. But in any event, there's a lot to unpack here. First, I got to think the news makes you happy as a guy who wanted more build up between movies. What are your thoughts just on uh, that we might be getting less Star Wars movies, so more build up in between them? Yeah, I think that's good, but I this is still a ton of Star Wars movies. I mean, you, this is say Benioff and Weiss are doing just one movie, which I don't believe they are. No, I, that's still five movies on the slate, so it's not like we aren't getting a bunch of Star Wars movies because you have three from Ryan Johnson, Episode Nine, and one Benioff and Weiss, which I'm guessing is more. Um, so go ahead and and spend more time thinking these projects out and planning them out right. Cause it'll probably only make them better and solve a lot of the bumps they've had in the road to try and get some of this stuff done. So, yeah, I'm I'm completely fine with this. I can't say that a Boba Fett movie interests me. I you know, Much like you feel kind of about Maul, I would rather Boba Fett just stay dead. Yeah. I don't need to know more about him or see more adventures. I feel like I already him. saw too much of him in the prequels, to be honest. I liked him better before the prequels. Oh, yeah, okay. I Yeah, and I, I, I mean, I know he's in there, but, you know, I think of Django as a better character, personally, than because he actually does something relatively effectively Fair enough. but e- either way i don't i don't need more of either of them so if they're going to take more time and plan these things out i'm completely fine with that i would i i don't know if they need to ditch the whole brand because i think that's a little knee jerk i mean rogue one made over a billion dollars yeah and like not even i mean a billion and a third i mean it yeah was it. it did fine so to say the whole brand is in jeopardy because one didn't go well 
and one did is kind of ridiculous. I mean, imagine if Marvel had scrapped everything because Incredible Hulk did bad. That was the second one of their cinematic universe, and people forget that one even exists. Now, obviously, there's more buildup around Star Wars than there was around Marvel at that time, but, you know, just, just keep moving and, you know, evaluate what you're doing and, and hopefully get that some of these bumps worked out, but I think it's fine and it's a good move for me. Yeah, I... I, I go back and forth. I, I will want more Star Wars films all the time. I, the, the, the hype doesn't really bother me. I don't get that much more excited for a year wait than I do for a six-month wait. I think it's an overreaction. I want it to be Star Wars movies in December, one a year. We may still get that, depending on when these Benioff and, uh, and Weiss movies come out. Uh, but I think it's kind of an overreaction, and I was worried that that might happen. Uh, if you pay attention on social media, there are people out there I sound like the president right now. People are saying uh, that Ryan Johnson's trilogy would never be made, this new upcoming trilogy, that with revenue from the toy sales and the decline, Disney would eventually dump the divisive director in favor of something more unifying. Uh, it seems like it's the exact opposite. Is this Disney just following the money by doubling down on the episodic films that have been so successful? Or is it a tacit middle finger to those who have hated The Last Jedi? Why does it have to be either of those? Neither of those. I mean, those are both very negative reactions. They both assume... I guess I'm just a negative guy. Well, you don't, like, you don't like the movie, and you've gone back and decided, and, you know, you like what you like, but you've now gone back and said you don't like things that you liked previously of Ryan Johnson. And the way you phrase this, the only way, the only answers you can pick are ones that Ryan Johnson is awful. And the, I don't think making a ton of money at the box office is awful. No, but the way you phrased it was, are they just taking the money? No, I, as, as if okay, they, that's you maybe know, unfair. But I, I mean, they're a business who goes after a profit. But you're making the assumption that n everyone thinks this movie is bad, which a no, lot 46 of forty six percent of people on Rotten Tomatoes on the audience were like it, which a lot of people don't don't feel the same way you do. Right. And Disney from the get go has talked about how much they love this movie and how, how great they thought it was. And maybe they just really like what he did and they're doing what everyone yells at everyone else to do. Right. What people are saying about solo, they're saying fine filmmakers you believe in and you trust and just go with them and let them have a vision. Don't do these things by committee. Don't just try to pick what's favorable at the time. Pick people you believe in. So maybe the answer is they just believe in Ryan Johnson and they're happy with the movie he made. They're happy with the returns on the movies that they got that he got back. And they're saying, this is the direction we're going to go. And I think by doing it in the way they're doing it, giving him his own thing that's not connected to the main saga, um, they're also maybe placating a lot of the people who want to whine and complain about the movie all the time because they're not, you know, messing with their treasured nostalgia that they can't yeah. let go of and move on. So okay. I, I think the answer is they believe in Ryan Johnson. I didn't, I didn't mean it to be negative by saying that they're, they're, they're going after money. I mean, I, I'm going into the argument that, that these businesses go after money and box office returns. I'm trying to say that Last Jedi is a smash hit. So I, I didn't mean that no, you as did, negatively as you took you did, it. You just left out the option that they think it's a good movie and he's a good filmmaker. Yeah, that could be too. So do you think that that's the answer? Yeah. Okay. Um, in the last episode, I think this is fascinating. Um, in the last episode, we talked about lengths, about why Solo didn't do so well. And we talked about the effect that the trolls probably didn't have, but we don't really know how much effect they did have or didn't have. And what I think is interesting about this is if they had any effect at all through this boycott of Solo, they're going to get more of a focus on Ryan Johnson, like the opposite of what they wanted. On the alternate side, people who really love The Last Jedi, one of the reasons why is because of the diversity of characters and, and the, the push for diversity. But by getting rid of some of these, um, or at least putting on the back burner some of these solo Star Wars, or I'm sorry, the Star Wars saga films, you're going to have less diversity as far as the decision makers, the writers and the directors and stuff like that. And so on both sides, it's almost like nobody's getting what, what they actually wanted out of the deal. And I think it's, I think that's interesting to me. I don't know. So one of the negative parts about this is that there's not going to be, you know, a female director or a non-white male director. And I think that's, that's kind of one of the drawbacks of this this whole thing. But we don't know who's directing the Benioff and Weiss movies. They're writing them. Well, They're, that's right. You're right. I so we could still that. have female and minority directors in those roles. And let's not let's not kid ourselves. This isn't the end of anthology Star yeah. Wars movies. We're still going to be getting Star Wars movies for a long, long time. It's just the end of 
two other ones, and the other one was James Mangold, who I like, but again, a white male, right. and um, Obi-Wan, which we don't know where that was going at this stage, I don't believe. So, really, if you're looking at it that way, they've cut one movie that possibly could have gone to a minority director. So, I, I think we're still in decent shape, but again, I, you know, let's hope Benny Off and Weiss... Or whoever's producing them, I'm assuming they have control over that. You know, but let's hope that they finally embrace what Disney's been kind of lip serving us that they want to do. Right. They'll show us, don't tell us, sort of thing. Uh, I saw on Gizmodo, io9, Popular Mechanics, and other websites that there was a guy out there uh, that goes by the handle of EC Henry on YouTube who tested the aerodynamics of a Star Wars spaceship. And, or a lot of Star Wars spaceships, I should say, and found that they were all pretty much terrible. Uh, doesn't interest me as much as finding out what spaceships you really liked. We talked about my love of the N1 Starfighter, which actually uh, scored the best. Um, but what what ships do you like out of the Star Wars universe? So this is kind of a boring answer, but um, I like X-Wings okay. the best. I think X-Wings are amazing and awesome. And then you follow that up with the, the classic original trilogy Star Destroyers. I, I think those are by far the two coolest ship designs and they they haven't done any better i am with you though that the naboo cruiser is one of the best ones ever uh maybe close to the best part of that movie minus darth <laughs> maul uh, are seeing those those ship designs so those are the ones that really jump jump out at me i can definitely tell you my least favorite is the vulture droids in the prequels those are the ones like the, that have like the middle the, the they're basically droids that are space fighters yep yeah, those ones don't do it for me at all. But um, yeah, most of the ship designs I really like. Like, other than those, I have a hard time struggling to think of one that I really don't like. Yeah, I would agree with you. I I, I liked a lot of um, the freighters in the extended universe. There was a video game where, and, and I don't know if, if Lucas himself came up with this from old um, old ideas that people put forth, but there was a freighter that they used in the Clone Wars series that I liked from a video game way before, and that's Anakin's oh, awesome. the one that he stole, and so I've always kind of been into that ship. But um, the, for me, the N1 Starfighter, obviously the Millennium Falcon, YT-1300s, but um, yeah, yeah, I just thought it was interesting. Yeah. TIE Fighters suck in atmosphere. So. <laughs> not, not surprising, I guess, that yeah. none of that fits. I mean, that, I also heard a, a theory once of someone believing that in the Star Wars universe there's oxygen, in the in outer space because that would explain uh sound the and the sound right. and you know people not immediately dying when they're in space and all those things so i'm just gonna run with that too let's just go with it hey guys if you're out there and want to contact the show we'd love to hear what you have to say we can be reached at kids radio at gmail.com or you can send us a message at kids seriously at luke underscore nice or at my Madrid and fire off a question for everyone's favorite segment emails that kids seriously got by the way, it doesn't have to be an email. This week we have an email from Javier Perez in SoCal. Javier writes, Did you guys hear there are people on Twitter trying to get people to invest in remaking The Last Jedi? That's not going to happen, of course, but if it did, and you had to hire a new director, who would you go with? Ah, uh, a new director to redo it, and I can't hire Ryan Johnson. I guess. Really well, like, just no, for no, no, obviously they wouldn't, that would be funny. they wouldn't do that. Right. So I'm trying to think off the top of my head who I, I mean, there's, there's directors I really like, I guess uh, we've said this before, probably Denny Villeneuve yeah. would be who I would go for. I know he can do sci-fi that I like in multiple forms. Cause I liked Blade Runner. I liked Arrival. Um, I really liked Prisoners. So he's done a lot of different things that I've liked. I, I wouldn't mind seeing Guillermo del Toro get weird with it. I think that would be the space cows would be amazing. The space milk or the cow milk. Exactly. <laughs> and then the, the last one would be, um, well, you know what? No, I'm actually going to throw another one out there. I'll say, um, give Alex Garland a go with it because he's, he did, Anni was it Annihilation? He did Annihilation. He did Ex Machina. He wrote 28 days later. So he's, I do really like him. He's doing, he's doing well for me so far. He wrote the novel, the beach, uh, so give it, give him a go. That would be a, a fun one too. I like uh, Ryan Coogler and I've, I've, I have not seen Creed yet, but it's well respected. I've not seen Fruitvale Station yet, but amazing. it's well respected. I know it's amazing, but you told me that I have to be in a certain mood to see it and I'm afraid to watch it. Uh, but I love Black Panther. And so in looking for an adventure film, he is my adventure film maker of choice at the moment. So that's what I would go with, but. Um, I don't think this is a very good idea. I think it's one of the stupidest things I have ever heard in my entire life. 
And the sooner people stop talking about it, the better, because it's just embarrassing for everybody who likes Star Wars. Ah, you know, it's it's people trying to get mentioned on there, which is the whole point, right, of a lot of that platform is to say dumb things and get people to notice, and they're achieving that, and I think that's the biggest goal they could have. I mean, they already got Ryan Johnson talking about it and other other people, and I'm sure that's all they were really setting out to intend to do. I mean, obviously, they're not going to get the, the rights to do this or the money to do this, but, you know, if Seth Rogen wants to chat with them for a while on Twitter, I bet that's giving them more than enough gratification that they need to justify the time they've devoted to it. This is exactly my strategy when it comes to uh, discussing soccer with Wink Martindale on Twitter. Just <laughs> saying nice. whatever just to get him to Say talk whatever. back. All right, should we talk about the Clone Wars? Wando should have scarred. Wando, Wando missed. <laughs> Put that in your hashtag and smoke it. Season 1, Episode 19, Storm Over Ryloth. It is a rough road that leads to the heights of greatness. Drink Gatorade. Directed by Brian Kalen O'Connell and written by the trio of George Christick and Scott Murphy and Henry Gilroy, Storm Over Ryloth is the first part in a trio of stories dealing with how the war affects the home planet of the Twi'leks. In this installment, Ahsoka goes rogue, putting clone lives in the balance. Luke, take it away. So this one, it's funny because normally I do this kind of beat for beat plot breakdown or whatever, but there isn't that much yeah. to this actual story. Which isn't a bad thing necessarily, but it, it opens up on, on Ryloth, which is a planet that's been invaded by a new leader that we're seeing, which is Wat Tambor, who's just a... as racist as the old Trade Federation. Well, Wat Tambor is part of the Techno Union, and he's only there uh, via hologram, but he's the new leader of this this fraction. Oh, I'm sorry, and I actually the... like the Techno Union guys. Okay. I think they're kind of fun with their gears. And I'm their... A, I'm at the co commander. I'm sorry. Yeah. So so he's. So Watt is the leader of this army, but at this specific planet, it's being led by a guy from the Trade Federation, and they don't actually say his name, which I thought was weird. I actually rewatched just to try and find out what his name was, and they never they never say it. But again, we're doing the, the horrible Asian accent, uh, which I wish... I, you would think at this stage they would have learned that you don't need to carry that over into the series, just... Just do something different and still have that character design. But he is leading a blockade of the planet, Phantom Menace style, where they are got their spaceships lined around the planet and then they're doing terrible things down to the people there and those people are starving to death is what we're led to believe. So the plan here is that Anakin and with Ahsoka have a couple battle cruisers that they're gonna lead in here to try and block the to break up the blockade so that Obi-Wan, who is trailing with some other battle cruisers, can bring his ground forces in to take over the planet. So Anakin and Ahsoka arrive, and this is going to be Ahsoka's first big mission to lead these troops. They're going to let her take a battalion of bombers and fighters out there to go and break the blockade up, along with her new droid R7. And we immediately know these, these clones are in trouble because they get names. <laughs> and unless your name is Cody or Rex, you do not want a name as a clone trooper because it's not going to end well for you. Happy Scrappy. Exactly. The leader is Axe of her. He's basically the Captain Rex. Because he gets the Axe. Yes. Cool. Yes, he does. So they go out there and, uh, you know, they go they go to fly and Soka's a little nervous, but she's excited for this. Um, and they, they go out there and basically they find out they've, they've flown into a trap and all the fighters are, are going down and the Admiral... And Obi-Wan order her back, and she refuses at first, and they start to lose a bunch of their fighters. And then Anakin really yells at her, so she decides to return to the ship, and uh, a bunch of the, the battle cruisers are damaged as well, and they basically have to emergency jump to hyperspace just to get out of there. And I think they lose two of their three battle cruisers. No, they lose one, one and then two are able to make the jump to light speed and get out. Axe dies, as we knew he was going to, loyal to the end, of course, and they get back there. The Admiral has also been put in a coma because they were able to attack the battle cruiser, and it was hurt, and he and he was hurt in that battle. And Anakin is very, very disappointed in Ahsoka, who takes it very hard, the loss, which was interesting because she was losing people right away at the battle and didn't care. She really only cared that Axe died. <laughs> 
and the general or the the admiral got hurt. We've been to this watering hole before. Earlier in this series, Anakin didn't listen, lost his clones. When he messed up, some clones died. When Ahsoka messes up, more than seventy five hundred people died, and it gets no mention. Yeah. This is problem. This is kind of the problem that I have with this episode. Like we've seen it before, except when the boy does it, he's like the hero, and when the girl does it. Like, if you stop and think, like, there are mass casualties here. I mean, it's yeah. not even, it's it's not even close in comparison. And so I just kind of shook my head at this. Well, it's always a funny balance, too, because they've had episodes about how no one cares about how the clones die, and the clones are having to deal with the fact that no one cares if they die. And then sometimes clones are even talk about how it doesn't matter if they die. Exactly. Right. And and then in episodes, we'll have mass clones killed and no one bats an eye and they'll sacrifice them in a heartbeat. And then we'll have an episode where one with a name dies and it's the worst thing ever and everyone's Or that sad. everybody will risk everything for the clones. You know, yeah. And then like an entire episode about how important the clones are. Yeah. Right? The, I mean, basically, if Pick I was lane. if I was a clone that was not named Rex or Cody, I'd be trying to shoot Rex and Cody in the back just out of <laughs> spite and anger that they somehow deserve rescue every single time when no one else does. But they, they go back out of hyperspace and they try to regroup and Ahsoka doesn't want to participate really anymore. I did notice, this is a weird character design thing, this is the first time I noticed a scene that Ahsoka has a Padawan braid. Which I've never noticed in any other episode, but she had one here. Yeah, like Obi-Wan, yeah. 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 Uh, I've never noticed it before, so I don't know if it's always been there. They just started adding it in, but... I don't know. I, I thought it had. I thought I had noticed it before, but... Um, yeah. So I'm going to keep an eye out for that. Moving That can be your new drinking game every time you see Ahsoka's Padawan braid. You have to drink a shot, and we'll see if you get real <laughs> drunk or stay sober. But uh, they, they decide on a new plan, and Anakin's got to kind of, you know, rile her up and get her excited and back in it, and he has... This real kind of ballsy plan and stuff where he is going to go out there in a battle cruiser and basically ram their ship with his battle cruiser, and then he's going to eject along with R2, but they need uh, Ahsoka to lead the other cruiser in to basically rescue him and then lead the assault because the blockade will be crippled by being battering rammed. She doesn't want to do it. The clones doubt her. They're not sure if she's a real leader. Anakin goes on this mission anyway, being like, I'm just going to basically push you off the cliff and make you force you to you know to to swim sink or swim because i'm doing this so she she eventually snaps out of it she steps up they they ran the cruiser and uh she does a weird maneuver where she just turns her battle cruiser on the side and suddenly it's indestructible which i don't know why they just don't do that all the time <laughs> but they, they do that and they're able to destroy the blockade basically just in time and they're able to save Anakin, obviously, and bring him back, and everyone's proud of her. Obi-Wan arrives, and they're ready for the ground forces. The one thing that I did say, and we, we ripped on the the Trade Federation guy, deservedly so, because this accent stuff is bullshit, but when you put that aside, I liked him as a villain because he wasn't an idiot. Mm -hmm. he, he respected Anakin. When he found out and realized it was Anakin, he researched the different tactics that Anakin had used to counter them. Uh, he knew when his plan failed and he escaped. Like, we've had a lot of bumbling idiot leaders other than, you know, Dooku and Ventress and Grievous. And even they can be bumbling and idiotic sometimes. So I was kind of relieved that this guy didn't seem incompetent when he was out there. So it's a it's a longer arc, so I'm hoping we're getting more of him in it with hopefully a different voice. You know, that's not going to happen. But no, it's not. So two two questions for you. Um, or a couple comments, I should say. Uh, the the first question I have is, what did you think of the space battle here? I enjoyed it. I was out of this episode until the space battle. I had it ranked very, very low because of my irritation about the Trade Federation guy and kind of making Ahsoka's mistakes so much worse than Anakin's of the same thing. Those things really bothered me. But the space battle kind of brought it back for me, and I wanted to see what you thought about it. I liked both of them, because it opens with a space battle, sure. and it ends with a space battle, and I liked both of them, and I feel like we haven't had a good space battle in a while, so it was nice to have that back, because space battles are always my favorite, and I thought these were both good. It wasn't just stuff kind of slamming together like we've had in other ones. It wasn't overwhelming blaster fire. It, it was, was cool shots, too, the way yeah. that they set it up, and the way that they not only set up the battle, but the way that we viewed the battle, sort of things zooming by, and um, it was a different taste there. One one issue that I had with this was that Anakin and R2 by themselves are flying that cruiser. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, it's just kind of flying straight, 
But if there are about 7,500 crew that might make these things operational, and if Han Solo can barely, like, fly the Falcon without a co-pilot, like, what the hell? You yeah. Can't just yeah. have one dude flying it. Like, a, well, imagine, like, a, like, a, like, an aircraft carrier. Just one dude on an aircraft carrier? Come on. Well, and the bigger thing, too, was... Because you, you could compare a lot of this episode to The Last Jedi, because there's a lot of similar things that happen. But the difference between this and what General Hodo does is General Hodo goes to light speed really quickly, where this ship of Anakin's, almost in slow motion, is coming at these trade federations. I, since apparently my new thing is to compare everything to Austin Power scenes, it was a lot like in the first one where there's the guard and the forklift, and the guard's yelling, <laughs> no, no, like he's about to get run over. And then they show you a perspective, and it's really far away. This was the same thing. I was like, why doesn't the Trade Federation ship just move? Because they figure out right away what he's doing. Mm -hmm. You know, they know he's alone on the ship and he's coming for them. And they just kind of sit there and evacuate rather than just, let's just move a step to the left and we're, we're good. <laughs> Should be all right. Yeah. So, yeah, that was a little a little awkward. <laughs> but you know what? I, this episode is, for me, very forgettable. It's very throwaway. I, I, don't, I don't hate it. It moved relatively fast for me, but this is never an episode you'd go back and rewatch. This isn't one you'll ever remember. The themes, as you mentioned, are stuff we've all talked about before. It's just very blah, and I'm hoping that now that we've gotten through it, there'll be something more interesting in the rest of the arc. But this is completely throwaway. One thing that I, another thing I want to mention too, the Republic's admirals. I was kind of rooting for that guy to die. <laughs> Here's why. They keep falling for the same damn trick all the time, where there's just like, oh, there's a space station out here by itself, so we're going to just bring three cruisers, and then the next thing you know, a bunch of ships jump out of hyperspace yeah. and kick the crap out of them, and it's like, you know what? You deserve to die. You're a bad admiral. You keep getting screwed by the same trick. Well, and why why don't you just bring Obi-Wan's ground force is with you at the same time, and then just have all the... I mean, you, you would have had eight cruisers come into the system then at once instead of three, and you probably could have overwhelmed them, even without their plan. So there, there is some of those things. I also don't really get the chain of command, because was he in charge of Ahsoka? I've never gotten the impression that Jedi had to report to, to anyone. anyone right? But they kind of made it seem like like he he did have control over her, but then... It kind of made it seem like he didn't, because even Anakin's kind of like, well, I don't care that you didn't listen to his order. I don't care you didn't listen to mine. Right. Like, so I, I don't really get that relationship, but maybe that muddied water is something that's muddied in their whole military operation, and that's why they're kind of bad at everything, because they don't, the Jedi get to do whatever they want. So. I'm, I'm choosing to believe now that this is the unraveling of the Jedi. That's how I'm going to yeah. view this, because we know from Obi-Wan, I saw a meme about this earlier today, that for thousands and thousands of years, the Jedis were like the peacekeepers. And for the 19 years from the time Anakin's born, from the time that Qui-Gon's like, let's boot it up, come on, kid, you're coming, till Vader takes over, it's just like the Jedi completely falling apart. Which I think fits well into what The Last Jedi was talking about, about how like it's time for the Jedi to end and you know to start something new. So I think... Um, that's how I'm choosing to look at this from now on. It's just well, like, this think, is the end of the Jedi. This I is think, not what the Jedi were in the olden times. This is just them screwing up. And I think Qui Gon even has a line in Phantom Menace that's something to the effect of, you know, we're we're peacekeepers, we're not soldiers. And it really, really shows. But the, the the best thing I could come up with on the Admiral thing, since we're both fans of Apocalypse now, is it may be Ahsoka's mission, but it damn sure is the Admiral's boat. So. <laughs> That's that's the best I can figure out with what their relationship was. Excellent. How uh, how many pews? Uh, we'll give it three. Right three in the middle. Right doesn't middle. matter. We'll never never talk about this one again after today. <laughs> I'm going to talk about it every episode from now on. Yeah. Just to you. I have it right around the middle, too. Uh, we have, what, 19 episodes? This is 10. Almost right in the middle for me. It, it would have been higher... Uh, maybe a couple spots higher without the blatant racism. Um, I thought the <laughs> yeah, the excellent... I love that we have to say that <laughs> right. more than once in a show. We're like we would really like this if it wasn't for this blatantly racist thing that happened. Right. Um, the the end of the episode I thought was really cool, so that's why I kind of gave it. You know, kind of originally I was thinking it was down below yeah. all the malevolence that we talked about oh, earlier in the season. That went forever. Um, but yeah, well, we'll and and as much as I ripped on the turning the ship on the side, it, it was a different approach to a space battle. It wasn't just you know, it would have been very easy to just be like, well, we'll just have more laser blasts, and that's how we'll just, end this. But just they more, yeah, exactly. It's like but pieces of flare. they did exactly. But they did they did something else, so that made it interesting to watch, even if it probably doesn't make sense long term. 
Hey, let's talk about other new. Let's talk about other nerd news that's got you going this week. What are you into? I'm a nerd. We have news for the beautiful people. There's a lot more of us in our view. So uh, you mentioned it earlier, but I, I saw Annihilation. Have you? Did you watch? I've not seen it. Okay, I really liked it. It's it's really good. There are a couple things that I I won't mention spoiler wise that didn't click with me at the end that I think could have been stronger. But for the most part, I I really enjoyed it. It's really good performances. Ninety percent of the visuals are really good, with one kind of glaring exception, but it doesn't kill the movie. It's my type of sci-fi. Well, I suppose this is funny because we're talking about Star Wars, but it's 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 a it's about it's about things in the sci-fi drives that as opposed to we're going to put some shit in space and then we'll make a story around it. So the, the characters are interesting. The non-sci-fi elements are interesting. You know, it's Natalie Portman. She always does great. There's actually a lot of Oscar Isaac is in this. Uh, Benedict Wong has a small role in this. Jennifer Jason Lee. So there, there's a lot of good, good people that you can kind of always count on that are handling it, and it's awesome. And if you know anyone that is into shrooms, they just need to put the end credit scene on, and they will have one of the best times of their life. <laughs> so, I I was really excited. I I'm excited to see where Alex Garland goes next because he, he, 28 Days Later he wrote that, and that's that's one of my favorite horror movies of all time. And I I love that genre, and I love I loved zombies before. They we had too much zombie saturation, so that movie is something that I go back to repeatedly because it redefined them with something as simple as just making them run fast. Um, and then you know, Ex Machina Ex was Machina the, is the best movie I've seen in a long time. I love that movie. Yeah, that that movie was fantastic, and and I I really like the movie The Beach. I've never read the novel, but I think the reason that movie failed is because everyone wanted Leonardo DiCaprio to be Titanic Leonardo DiCaprio, and this movie was not, not that, that. Which is a credit to Leonardo DiCaprio for choosing different projects. I watched two thirds of that movie and okay. then got interrupted, and I have. I love that movie. I gotta, I can't, I gotta look for it on Netflix or Amazon Prime when it comes out because I love the first two thirds of the movie and just never made it back and really want to finish it. But I, I would agree with that. Like that is not your Titanic Leonardo DiCaprio. That's no, that was a clear decision to be. I'm gonna try different things and obviously it's worked out for him mm -hmm. throughout his career. And I haven't seen that movie. in I don't know, 15, 20 years. Since. Chill Pony was all about that movie, wasn't it? And that's who I watched it with because we we were roommates. So and I I loved it. So Alex Garland's got a real high batting average for me, yeah. and I'm really excited to see what he does. I feel like I have a a nice stable of directors that I've gotten really into, and now I'm getting to a point where I think they'll be spread out enough where I can get maybe a movie a year because Steve McQueen has a movie coming out soon, which um, I'm excited for, even though it's kind of the least exciting premise of any of his movies for me, but he's batting a thousand so i'm gonna see whatever he does um carrie fukunaga has got to be getting close to to something new um i still wish i could have seen his version of it even though i like what they they did andrew muschetti did um and then you know you get you got alex garland you got ryan coogler there's a, a denny valen new there's there's a lot of great directors out there you have any idea how long that dune movie is till it comes out I don't, but I would be happy to look it up while you tell me something that you're into. Well, a few weeks back, we did... That's called a segue. Oh, that was really good. <laughs> that was smooth. impressive. I used to work in radio. Uh, a few weeks ago, we did Maya and Luke Saw trailer about the new Robin Hood movie, and making fun of that movie made me want to go back and enjoy Robin Hood again. Robin Hood, as I said in that, the Fox? In that show... Just the character. Oh, okay. Just the character. That character, whether you're talking about the Disney Fox or whether you're talking about uh, the the books, or the, that's one of my favorite characters. I just love the premise. I love so much of what that character is about. And my favorite representation of Robin Hood is the one from the mid two thousands, the BBC Robin Hood that's on Amazon Prime, where oh. Jonas Armstrong plays the character. And I've had so much fun going back and rewatching it. Um, from the sort of, it, it's basically just swashbuckling and you've got Robin Hood who's, you know, arrogant and grandstanding, but always does the right thing. Just like, kind of like the classic rogue character. You have a, a show that doesn't take itself too seriously. You have like a mustache twirling villain, a uh, badass female protagonist. And it's, it's so much fun. Like I just, I love that television show. And so if you've got Amazon Prime out there, 
Um, I search it out, watch the first episode, see if you enjoy it. It really reminds me of the things that I love about Indiana Jones, the things I love about Star Wars. That show takes one of my favorite characters and does that same sort of thing with it. And I can't recommend it enough. And, and you know, if you're out there and you watch one episode and it's not your thing, totally cool. It doesn't take itself seriously. Like, the, the action scenes are kind of, like, hokey. It's kind of, like, uh, tongue-in-cheek with a wink. Uh, but I love it. I love it. I can't get enough of it. I'm going to go home and watch it after the show. So what do you think of Kevin Costner and Robin Hood? When I was little, I loved it. When I was little. Um, because it was Robin Hood. Um, I've never gone back to watch it again, I'm afraid. I, I haven't watched it in a really long time, too, but I, re- I really liked it, except he's really wooden. Like, he's mm-hmm. not he's not very good at what he does, but everyone else does really well. I like really Christian well. Slater in that movie. I remember liking him. Well, th- to me, it, it's all about Alan Rickman. Like, just chewing the scenery and being over the top and mm-hmm. being just awesome Alan Rickman. So I, I he was in it. Yeah, yeah. It's the, by far the best parts. And, you, you know, you... It would be, I'm curious, it's kind of, I'm tempted to be like, oh, I kind of want to go back and see if it's just mm-hmm. the worst thing ever, or if it still kind of holds up, but I, I don't know where it goes. I mean, you know, worst case scenario, I get to listen to Brian Adams for two hours, so <laughs> there's always that, that to keep me going through. And that is the worst case scenario, except for, this is now the end of our episode. Was this episode 21? 20, 20, 21. 21. So, for, at Luke underscore Neitzel. And at Maya Madrid, we are kids seriously, and we are saying goodbye. Bye. Thanks for listening to Kids Seriously. If you didn't completely hate us, feel free to hit like, subscribe, or tell a friend about the show. If you want to write to us and tell us how much we suck, or just ask a question, you can reach us at kidsseriouslyradio at gmail.com. Otherwise, hit us up on Twitter at Kid Seriously. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.